Now, enough housekeeping. Let me switch to my guest. Peter, it's great to welcome you on screen, on stage, and uh, I'm excited to have you come join us. Uh, you will be giving a presentation on your selection process for the fund. And I think that's really, really important to see how to invest in early stage exploration companies. And uh, I'm excited you'll be running us through that in the next 20 minutes. And uh, thanks for joining us, Peter. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Guy, for the intro. So let's uh, get right to the presentation. So here you can see uh, six of our key criteria in uh, screening deals which I will highlight in the slides that follow with examples. And uh, I've uh, saved uh, the juiciest for last, our uh, one strike and you're out principle, because you cannot always count on regulators to remove offenders from the road. So you have to do it by yourself because it's literally a minefield out there. So let's get started with the first criterion, the asymmetric bets. So why uh, do we like asymmetric bets and why are we looking for high payoffs? Peter, Peter, Peter I hate to yeah. jump in, but you need to share your screen. Ah, I'm not sharing my screen. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> here you go. Yeah, so here are the six uh, key criteria in our uh, screening process. And these three screening, these uh, six uh, criteria, I will highlight in the slides that follow. Uh, so uh, I was at the asymmetric bets one. Uh, so why are we looking for a high payoff? Uh, because uh, the uh, success odds are just very low. Um, so you need to have a high payoff uh, when you actually make a discovery. Uh, so here you can see, for instance, Canada as an example. Uh, there, in the last two decades, there basically only were five grassroots discoveries of 2 million ounces of gold plus. And in the two decades before that, uh, there were 22. And it wasn't for a lack of trying because uh, in Canada, every year over $1 billion is spent on exploration. So those five grassroots discoveries were the results of over 20 billion in exploration expenditures. So when you get lucky and when you make the discovery, you need a high payoff. Uh, to compensate also for the many failures. So what we're doing is uh, venture capital in resources. Um, so if you see the uh, Barbell investing strategy of uh, Nassim Nicolas Taleb, the philosopher, uh, we are at the right end of the Barbell. So big payoff, but with high risk. Um, so our investors have to cover the uh, Barbell bar themselves. And if you look at the precious metals sector, uh, the barbell bar is actually the precious metals equities, the seniors, the producers, and the developers. And that's not a domain that we are interested in uh, because basically the returns are just dismal on average because from 1963 to 2015, for instance, the real return of precious metals equities has been 0.1% negative according to a study by William Bernstein. Um, so uh, how, how can we get these asymmetric payoffs? Because we're basically investing in, in companies worth millions that can find for billions of metal worth in the ground. Um, and you can create additional leverage on the upside without additional risk by obtaining warrants uh, in these juniors via private placement. So uh, we try to increase our success odds in making a discovery by a rigorous research and screening, which I will highlight also in the slides that follow. So in uh, plethora of precious metals, we uh, often look at the whole domain of juniors that are listed. So in Canada on the TSX fee and on the CSE, there are over 1200 juniors. It's, it's amazing that there, that there are so many. Uh, and when we screened them uh, the last time, only 60 of those 1,200 companies actually warranted follow-up research in our view. Uh, and from those 60, we've done seven new private placements, uh, only 0.6% of the universe. Uh, we've, done, we've done more private placements, but those were in companies that we were already intimately familiar with or that we were already invested in. 
So one of our other uh, criterion is go big or go home. So we are looking for new IDs, big IDs. And it's not just us because we see a tendency of majors and mid tiers uh, to invest in companies that have districts. So that have big land packages uh, of a favorable host uh, for mineralization. Uh, so here we see a couple of examples of deals that actually also involved a big land package. So Sumitomo investing in Canorland, uh, IM Gold in Fanstar, Evolution Mining in Battle North. And in all of these cases, it, it involved uh, tens of thousands of hectares of land. Uh, so we are normally not looking for recycled projects. We're looking for new IDs um, and uh, a limited amount of historical work. Uh, if that's done, uh, we see that as a new ID um, because we, we regularly uh, hear the talk that uh, the old timers missed it, the previous operators missed that, but uh, old timers were not always idiots. Um, what they maybe lacked in technology uh, they made up for effort because you, you you basically don't walk away quickly from a hand dug shaft after all of that work. And also very simply, a small projects give as many headaches as a big one. So we like to think big. Uh, it's very simple. If you, if you start small, uh, the project rarely becomes bigger. And if you start big, you have a margin for it to become smaller. So uh, focus on the rock stars and the rocks. It's our view that the geologists make the discovery uh, and not bankers. So uh, how, how are the geologists actually incentivized? Are they working for just a salary? Then it might be in their interest to keep working on existing projects and agree to whatever management is saying, or they basically move to a different company in the blink of an eye. So uh, as Charlie Munger says, if you show me the incentive, I show you the outcome. Let's see how they are incentivized. And do they play a prominent role? Are they listened to? Are they, uh, giving, are they given an important role so that the discovery can be made? And also, it's our view that you have to conduct field work as soon as possible and focus on collecting multi-layered hard data. So uh, get into the field and acquire the data. And uh, for that, you need geologists. You need to do a lot of geochemical and geophysical surveys, have the boots on the ground by your own geologist at an early stage. So not just desktop work. And it's not always easy. You can see here from the pictures, field pictures from our geologist. So uh, very important that uh, you acquire that data and you get into the field as quickly as possible. Also, uh, look to falsify and not verify. Uh, so see where the fatal flaw is of a project. And for that, you, you can also hire, consult world-renowned world field-specific experts. Uh, for instance, uh, Dick Silito and Michael Skeet on gold, Tony Donahue for nickel. Uh, they give you an honest, independent opinion on your project. And if you hire them at an early stage, uh, you uh, can prevent the big spend on projects uh, that are actually not that interesting. But it's, it's not always rocket science. Uh, we see that the, the longer the press release, the shittier the results uh, normally. Uh, even directors of companies uh, say in their releases uh, that some of these press releases are actually barely uh, readable. Uh, for instance, we saw a press release recently by a company uh, where the annotations of a director uh, actually made it into the press release. So uh, here you can see that the director actually mentioned in the draft press release that it was barely readable, uh, but if it was buried enough, far enough in the release that, uh, that it was fine. So, and the results of course were shit. Also, uh, there's a treasure trove of information in, in historical assessment reports. Uh, for instance, here we have uh, a quote from an assessment report uh, on the Keats property in Newfoundland. 
the linear Keats uh, property. This report is from 2008, uh, actually partnered by Sprott Resource Corp, which is kind of interesting. Um, and there, there was a recommendation in there uh, that a step out drilling and an undercut drill hole beneath what was tested historically uh, would be actually a good idea because it has not been tested below uh, the shallow historical drill holes. And that's exactly what Newfound Gold did in November, December 2017, uh, 2019, sorry. And they made the big discovery and they are now worth 1.5 billion or something. So uh, you can get a lot of information from historical reports and it's very easy uh, to attribute things to scale, but it might actually be have been just luck. Drill to kill. So don't hang on to projects that didn't work out. Uh, it's not just not a good strategy, but it's also very costly because uh, a public company uh, already spends about half a million a year on GNA, listing fees, accounting, legal. So why would you be working on a marginal project? Uh, here's an example of a company that we invest in, in uh, Plethora Precious Metals, Prosper Gold. It was founded by uh, Pete Bernier and Dirk Templeman Cloud. Very successful in the past. They sold their previous discovery for over half a billion, uh, the Blackwater Gold Discovery in BC. And since 2016, since they launched this company, they actually cycled already through many projects, um, finding it, doing the groundwork, and eventually drill testing it. But that didn't work out so far. Um, and what they didn't do, they didn't hang on to those projects. They actually moved on to new projects. And it is because of that strategy that they are now actually uh, on the verge of a possible new gold discovery with the Golden Sidewalk project. Looks very interesting. We still have to see if this is going to be a discovery, of course. But uh, after all those iterations, they are now at a 30 million market cap with 6 million in cash. And would they have found Golden Sidewalk? Would they have been working on Golden Sidewalk right now, right now if they would have uh, hung on to those previous projects? We don't think so. And as Richard Shorter says of Minex Consulting, uh, you have to kiss several frogs to make a, gold, a good gold discovery. Uh, and those that do are special. Uh, but the challenge is uh, you have to find ways to be better than average. So by doing good screening. So strong and stable jurisdictions. Uh, here you see a, a pie chart of plethora private equity uh, where we are active. Um, the one on plethora precious metals is not much different from this one. So the majority is North America, and then there's a big contingent Scandinavia uh, for the base metal, uh, electri electricity metal uh, properties. And why are we active there? Uh, because it, we think it's very important that you are in an area uh, that respect ownership rights, have a clear mining law, mining exploration laws, familiarity with mining, cost of doing business and that you can work there in a sustainable and responsible manner. Uh, why? Because we don't want to stack risk upon risk. Uh, exploration is already a very risky business. So why would you add jurisdictional risk to exploration risk? Uh, we're not doing that. For, for example, I was on a, on a field trip once in uh, Lombok, Indonesia, uh, very friendly people there. Uh, but uh, when I was on site, uh, they told me that a week before, all the locals uh, that were working in the area actually set all the drill rigs on fire. Uh, so the illegal miners there just didn't want to have the Canadian company operate there. Uh, so um, not an area we are looking to invest in. So management and skin in the game. So we come back to the incentive slide that I showed before. So show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. So if management doesn't own shares or hardly has any shares, there's a big change of control clause. So uh, when there's uh, when the company changes hand, 
the management will receive a couple of years of salary, uh, the high salary element. So all these elements make us uh, to not invest in the company. If we look at the average in plethora of precious metals right now, uh, the average of the CEOs in the companies we invest in is a 3.3% equity interest and a very modest salary of 136,000 Canadian dollars. So that's an equity salary, salary ratio of over six. So that means that we are aligned with management. They are in the game to create shareholder value because they will get well rewarded in their equity valuation when something positive happens for the shareholder. So we are doing a lot of background checks. So there's a wealth of public information, new search, uh, CDI, CDAR, all these publications. And I'm also one of those persons uh, that never throws away an email. So I've kept all the emails from 2007 since I started in this sector, news outlets, broker reports, uh, other emails. So we, all, we always check the history of projects and people. Very important. And by that, you can already um, cross, the, cross out the majority of the companies out there. So always look at uh, what they say versus what they do. So here's a recent example of a company called Crest Resources. So on their company website, they say that their singular focus is on increasing shareholder value. But what do they actually do? So they announced a distribution of bonus shares uh, and though that distribution to management, so not to shareholders, but to management, was worth 9.8 million Canadian at the time of the announcement. And the market cap of the whole company was only 19 million. Uh, so on the right side, you can see what that did to the share price, um, but this was management friendly and not shareholder friendly. So here's another one. This is uh, a quote from an email we received in February, 2016. Um, the CEO, emailed us with the message that it was about the share activity, the activity in the share price. We do not believe any of our long holders or the small group that participated in the last financing are sellers down at these levels. However, we will buy ourselves out of the hole as we have always done. And in the days surrounding this email, actually the directors and management uh, we're actually selling shares in the market. And these people are still on the road because in, in, in Canada, promoters have an unlimited amount of lives. There is a sucker born every minute. Uh, this is another one. This is a company uh, that used to be called New Nadina Exploration. So this is from a press release on October 25th of 2017. Silver Queen drilling confirms high-grade sulfide target. We have drilled 132 meter of high-grade core. This day had to retract from the British Columbia Securities Commission a few days later, so they removed these quotes. But that didn't stop them from keeping on promoting the visuals. So here's an article in the Northern Miner uh, just a few weeks later. I knew it was a high-risk hole, but I had to get it out of my system. It was a now or never sort of moment. And then in a press release the same day, mission accomplished. We have found the treasure box. And then eventually uh, in January of 2018, on Friday after markets close, of course, we learned that there basically was only an interval of eight grams per ton silver and some other metals. So. There's, there's more metals in my backyard. So this, uh, you can see here what it did to the share price. And this company is also still around. It's now called Equity Metals or something. So here is our one strike and you're out principle. So if some, only one thing that uh, was, not, was not good, uh, we won't consider investing in your company anymore. So uh, let's start with great smearing. It happens every day. Uh, here, an example that comes to mind is Appleton Exploration. Uh, it was an explorer in Mali. 
Africa, and their headline hole was 10 meters of 192 grams. And uh, a couple of days later, they actually gave a breakdown of this 10 meter at 192 gram interval. And it was driven by a one meter at 1900 gram per ton cold interval. So that was smeared over the whole 10 meter intersection. Uh, and eventually they did metallics screening. And with this metallic screening, actually the most significant negative variation was, of course, in this intersection. So they could not uh, replicate this interval. And eventually the stock went back to almost zero. And you can check these residual grades of these drill results, for instance, on the uh, residual grade calculator on exploration insi insights. Uh, project recycling. So that happens, especially with high grade projects. These projects keep on coming back. Uh, for instance, the, the Golden Mile comes to, comes to mind. The Golden Mile used to be in a company called Kodiak Exploration. The stock went over $5 per share on millions of ounces of potential, but eventually it came crashing down after reporting just 210,000 ounces in a resource. So the Golden Mile was more like a gold needle in a haystack. And, and now there's a new company uh, trying to recycle this golden mile again. And uh, these projects never go away. Aggressive exploration. You know, so uh, you can remember the 65 to 90 million ounces of gold potential in the Cow Mountain of Parkerville Gold, geological potential. And uh, well, that didn't really uh, materialize. Also, what we see a lot recently is long sections where uh, they project a halo around a high grade interval and basically extrapolating the high grade interval to the halo. But eventually when they're actually drilling in the halo, they cannot replicate the high grade drill results. So be wary of those things too. Name changes. So that's not just with projects or companies but also by individuals uh, so that their history is actually more difficult to find. Just as an example, uh, Rob now calls himself Robin, and that's not because of a sex change. Uh, source and use of funds. So is the money going into the ground or are these just lifestyle companies? Uh, travel, entertainment, and housing. That's a category where you can find a lot of these hidden expenditures. For instance, if the CEO of a company is renting the whole gold floor of the Fairmont Hotel while walking around in a fur coat, uh, you will probably see those expen expenses end up in the financials. So be looking for those because sometimes in the management information circular, you will find the salaries, but the salaries are actually not giving you the whole picture. Um, also, have a good look at how these companies got started. So how did they obtain the projects? What did they have to pay for that? How, what is the history? Because sometimes these number of companies of, or projects are being vended in the public vehicle for a zillion amount of shares with a very low cost price. We see this, especially on the Canadian Securities Exchange, the CSE. So uh, be looking out for that as well. And let's see what else we have here. Um, yeah, we have the cost lifestyle companies. And well, yeah, I can go on and on about this, but uh, I think my time is almost up. So I will hand it over to Kai and Christian for questions. Fantastic. Peter, I love the presentation. I absolutely did. Absolutely fantastic. I like that you don't mince words. You're very direct. Uh, it's really, really appreciated because this sector needs it. Um, the sugar coating doesn't help anybody. So um, really appreciate you pointing out a couple negatives, actually, what to look out for. Uh, we got a question in the chat and we talked about the negatives. Let's talk maybe about a couple companies that you are invested in and maybe tell us why you're invested in them. And we have about uh, two, two, three minutes to talk about them. Okay, you mean on the precious metals uh, front? 
Yeah, yeah, precious metals yeah. or base metals, like anything that's in your portfolio. Why did you invest in it, and uh, why why were you attracted to it? Maybe name your top two holdings or so, or your favorites within the portfolio. Yeah, yeah what what I can recommend is on our uh, plethora PM website. We uh, have a couple of blogs online on deals that we've done recently. Uh, it's actually in Dutch, so you have to put a Google Translate on it. But what we what we tend to like in uh, in plethora precious metals uh, are companies with big land packages for the reasons that I highlighted. Um, and that's, that's, that's one of the common denominators. Also the skin in the game, for instance, I mentioned already Prosper, but another company that already have, has cycled through a couple of projects uh, is VR resources. So it's a VRR. And because they um, drill and kill and they move on from projects, they actually now have three high impact projects in there one is already drilled one they will drill when they receive a drill permit and the other one they will drill in september so it's quite rare to have that in a company with only 30 40 million market cap where also the ceo has a very good reputation and has a lot of skin in the game with a big share position so that that's that's what we like to see and in the private equity um, stable of companies uh, we are actually working towards an IPO of our new Foundland uh, based company and that's called Burin Gold and that's active on the Burin Peninsula belt, a huge, huge land package, like 160 square kilometers uh, of uh, a high sulfidation epithermal belt. Uh, that's the, that's the host there. And we already have a discovery. So, and the, the cool thing about the discovery is because we drilled seven holes last year. The cool thing is that the discovery hole is actually above the, the 50 gram times meter intersection. And we know from the, the study done by Canorland Minerals, the discovery study, that most 2 million ounce plus discoveries actually have a plus 50 gram meter intersection as the genesis uh, within the initial program. So, yeah, we're quite excited about that. So we think uh, this will be IPO'd in the fall of this year. Fantastic. And, P and Peter, we are, we're out of time. Where can we find more information about Plethora Private Equity? I think it's plethora-pe.com. Is that correct? Is that, that was the yeah. domain, correct? Yeah, that's true. And uh, uh, the PM fund is plethorapm.com. Fantastic. Peter, really, really love the presentation. I'm repeating myself, but that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for running us through your screening process. And uh, we'll make this presentation obviously available in our YouTube channel in a few days. So make sure to check back and rewatch it. There's some good information in it if you've missed it. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you in the fall. I hope everything can go on as planned. And I'll see you in Germany at uh, the Deutsche Goldmesse. Looking forward to it. Thanks, fantastic. guy. Peter, thank you so much.